This is In Deep. I'm Angie Cuero. America's culture has come a long way accepting LGBT citizens, but it is still a challenge for a young person to declare themselves gay, lesbian, or any way an other. This week, another young gay man killed himself when the bullying got too hard to take. It's our topic rebroadcast from our very first show, coming up next on In Deep. I'm Angie Cuero. This is In Deep. We are going to talk about an article that I wish I could bring you in its entirety. There's so much that's important in it. First of all, Walmart. When you hear Walmart, you know, that brings up all kinds of issues. People who are underpaid, people who have difficulty unionizing, globalization. But what struck me in this particular article, and it is, by the way, by our guest, R.J. Taylor Hahn, who writes a Somewhere in the Middle blog spot. You don't have to write that down. We'll put it on our website at indeepradio.com. We'll link you right to it. Now, he's got the icon that says Walmart sucks. Grabbed my eye immediately. And then R.J. went into a discourse on how it would actually behoove Walmart and similar large corporations to pay their employees more. Not that they should because it's moral, not that it's the good guy thing to do, but because it would help their bottom line. And given the time constraints we have, I can't tell you everything you had to say on that. It's a worthy read. I do encourage you to go to our website, indeepradio.com, and click on the on that somewhere in the middle link to read the whole article. But it got even more interesting toward the latter part of the article, where RJ introduced me and his other readers to something that's happening in Texas. I'm going to read directly from his article here. Millions of dollars in state subsidies designed to stimulate job creation have gone to a handful of Houston area employers, mostly in industries where wages are low and employee turnover is high. This is according to an analysis by the Houston Press. RJ, first of all, I, I want to welcome you for coming aboard. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. And, and this is something I, I really hadn't heard of, and I want to make sure I'm grasping this properly. This is public money that essentially goes through private companies, Walmart, call centers, security guard services, retailers, and it ends up in the hands of the employees so that they can in turn spend money and boost the Texas economy. Am, am I getting that correctly? Yeah, you're absolutely correct. Yes, uh, a little over $700,000 has has gone to Walmart. That is, that's fascinating. And this is a program that's called Texas Back to Work. And you have a quote in your article from the Texas AFL-CIO, and he says, we're paying them to fill the jobs they would ordinarily fill anyway. And he said those recipients highlight the labor group's concern with the program. So I can imagine for the unions, this brings about a whole new consideration. The employees might even be less inclined to look at unionizing or to look at other ways to better their situation if the city is underwriting their employment. That's a whole new situation. Yeah, it really is. And um, given the state of Texas itself being a uh, right-to-work state, with this infusion of this money going to these large companies and then being handed out, um, as they see fit, really, is just really appalling to me. It definitely undermines any union organization that there ever possibly could be. It's just really a silly it, – it's, it's silly. I mean, I just – as I was researching it, I couldn't believe what I was reading. I was flabbergasted. I was like, you've got to be kidding me, Walmart? <laughs> You know, this reminds me of my reaction. This is back when I was doing news for a, a local prominent public radio station. And the story came out that here in California, Walmart was handing its employees information on how to apply for unemployment benefits or underemployment benefits and how they could get their medical care taken care of. So Walmart was essentially hiring them here, knowing that they weren't giving them adequate money to work on. So they were saying hey, go to the state and go get this money and this extra care from them. And so what you have come across here, and of course, you know, that includes California's limited allocation of food stamps going to Walmart employees. And yeah. you seem to have come across, you know, a different version of that. This is Texas Back to Work. And according to your article, it was started with $15 million in funding from the state legislature. So mm -hmm. Walmart, again, has found some public money to keep them divorced from the reality that they ought to be paying more themselves. Yeah, exactly. And I'll tell you, Angie, what really kind of keyed off this 
me working, starting this piece and finishing it was I met a lady, a cashier at Walmart, and I had asked her um, how her Easter was going and uh, was, you know, she going to enjoy Easter. She had to work all night long. She goes, oh, no. She goes, I'm fixing to get off. Oh, you're getting off early? She goes, no. They only keep us all on part time so they don't have to pay any of our health benefits. Mm hmm. Very old so, story. Yep. Very old story. Yes. But it never, you know, I've written a couple other pieces on Walmart before. You know, they're, they're not fond of me. Um, and that's okay. <laughs> and also, I don't buy into the uh, Walmart's necessary evil thing. I, you know, I constantly hear that from the right and the left. And that's just ludicrous. What the state of Texas is doing allocating these funds is beyond imagination. Can you tell me, is, is there a foreseeable end to this? Is this an open-ended program, or does Walmart know that eventually this gravy train is going to come to a halt? I don't suspect this gravy train is going to come to a halt for them, not here in Texas, as, as long as Rick Perry has anything to do with it. Nothing's going to change. Um, it's got to change at the top and then work its way down. I'm really glad you brought this to our attention, RJ. Thank you so much for that. And we're going to direct people over to your website somewhere in the middle on Blogspot. Thank you for your time. All right. Thank you, Angie. RJ Taylor Hahn, who's talking to us from Texas. This is In Deep. I'm Angie Cuero. Another bullied gay teen has killed himself. 14-year-old Kenneth Weishan of Iowa apparently led a happy high school life until he came out. And then the hatred started. He was taunted. Bullies actually set up an anti-gay web page targeting him. His friends deserted him. They either joined the bullies or stood by silently, his sister said. And he told his mother, Mom, you don't know how it feels to be hated. Now, I've lost count of these stories. Jeffrey Fair of Sacramento hanged himself. His parents pointed to a lifetime of anti-gay bullying that he endured. Jamie Rotemeyer actually contributed a video to the It Gets Better campaign and then ended up hanging himself. You're going to hear more on both of those cases this hour. It's from the first show we ever aired, January 21st this year, and we were carried then on just one station. Now we want it heard more widely. Our guest founded his local chapter of the Bay Area Network of Gay and Lesbian Educators in San Jose, California. Now that was the culmination of a lifetime of shame and self-denial. Ron Schmidt was so bereft of gay role models, he took in wholesale the advice of the era he grew up with. You find the right woman, you ignore your feelings, you have kids, and he did all of that. And then then he finally had to become himself. Now, after this rebroadcast of the interview, we'll talk with the Gay, Lesbian, and Straight Education Network on the extent and limits of what parents and schools can do to confront bullies and bullying. So let's go now to my interview with Ron Schmidt from January of this year. We begin with the audio of Jamie Rotemeyer from It Gets Better, not long before his own suicide. Hi, this is Jamie from Buffalo, New York, and I'm just here to tell you that it does get better. Uh, here's a little bit of my story. Um, December 2010, I thought I was bi, and then I always got made fun of because I virtually have no guy friends. I only have friends that are girls, and it bothered me because people would be like, faggot, fag, and they'd taunt me in the hallways, and I felt like I could never escape it. And I made a form spring, which I should have done. And people would just constantly send me hate, telling me that gay people go to hell. And um, I just want to tell you that it does get better. Because when I came out for being bi, I got so much support from my friends. And it made me feel so secure. And then if your friends or family isn't even there for you, I look up to one of the most supporting people of the gay community that I think of, that I know, uh, Lady Gaga, she makes me so happy, and she lets me know that I was born this way, and that's my advice to you from her, you were born this way, and all you have to do is hold your head up and you'll go far, because that's all you have to do, just love yourself and your set. I promise you will get better, I have so much support from people I don't even know online. I know that sounds creepy, but they're so nice and caring and they don't ever want me to die. And it just is so, so much support for me. Yeah. So just listen here. It gets better. And look at me. I'm doing fine. I went to the monster ball and now I'm liberated. So it gets better. I'm so glad we have the It Gets Better effort. And there are wonderful people behind it, but it makes it somehow 
especially even worse, that, that this kid was so close to full self-acceptance and the personal strength to stand up to his terrorists, and then he didn't make it. So with these stories piling up, I thought the best first guest for our new show, In Deep, could only be Ron Schmidt. He has a riveting life story, a lot of wisdom to share. Now, we did have some technical problems recording our conversation, and it's, it's some of the audio is a little bit tweaked, but I, I urge you to bear with those small glitches. It is so worth it. Ron Schmidt is the author of Once Removed, a story of love, loss, and a cause championed, and I sat down with him in our Berkeley studio. Thank you so much, Angie. It's a pleasure to be here. We are going to get into your personal story, but tell me, how much resonance does the story of this young boy in Sacramento have for you? Well, it's wrenching because one of the major parts of my book refers to my first semester in Morgan Hill Unified School District here in uh, Santa Clara County, where an eighth grade student committed suicide, hanged herself in the backyard. There was evidence that perhaps she was trying to time this with the arrival of some family member coming home. She expected that that was going to happen, and it didn't, and she died there, uh, the noose around her neck. It was a tragic, tragic situation, and it sent shockwaves throughout the school district. As I say, I was brand new in the district. It was my first semester there as a temporary teacher. I I was in the process of moving directly toward coming out. And I went to my principal to uh, discuss concerns that I had after the school district brought a psychiatrist out from the county health department to talk to all the staffs at their various school sites. And he was supposed to be talking to us about why kids commit suicide, why these things happen, and in particular, the fear that there would be copycat uh, suicides. Students who knew this young girl very well and felt that they needed to do likewise. The reality is that this psychiatrist didn't tell any of us anything we already didn't know, except that he didn't take night calls. It was ridiculous. So I went to my principal the next day. And I said, if that was supposed to be dealing with the subject, then that was like putting a Band-Aid on a gaping wound. You know, there was, there had been no mention whatsoever of uh, a possible concern about sexual identity. Uh, I don't know whether this child was taunted for being lesbian or any other aspect of her identity. But I said to him, the reality is that Among the students who do commit suicide, a huge proportion are dealing with sexual identity issues, may be actually gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender, or if not, questioning other kids, taunting them, causing them to have this insecurity. You know what? I want you to hold that story right there because now I want you to bring our listeners in on what brought you to that point. And so we're going to talk a little bit about your own story. Okay. You realized you were gay when? Oh, I realized I was gay when I was a child, um, seven, eight years old, something of that sort. I, I didn't know a name for it at that point. Um, I just knew that I was different from my brother and my sister, raised in a very Catholic home. And as I grew older, everything about what I was feeling toward other males was clearly wrong as far as my church was concerned, as far as everything else in my society was concerned. Did you have anyone in your young life that that you looked at and said, well, if I am, although you didn't have the word for it, if I'm gay and I come out, I'm going to be treated like this person, or I'm going to end up like that person. What kind of role models did you have for making your choice about how to handle this? The only only role models uh, I had were the church confessors and so forth. I got no positive reinforcement from any of them. So I did a lot of agonizing in the confessionals and and that sort of thing. And it was a uh, very, very difficult period of growing up. Everything that I knew about being gay made me feel that I needed to change who I am. My confessors used to say to me when I would talk about the need to express myself in terms of homosexual tendencies and so forth, don't worry about these things. When you get married, they'll take care of themselves. Oh, I'm sure that worked out. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Well, the reality is, of course, that I wanted desperately to change who I was. And all through my schooling, that was the same situation at Santa Clara University. 
I had a priest who was the head of the theology department and understand the Jesuits were the intellectual elite of the church, still considered to be. I went to this particular priest and I said, I am skirting the edges of homosexuality and I don't know what to do about it. And his response was, if you are indeed a homosexual, you know whose fault it is, don't you? Your dear devoted parents. And he gave me the name of a psychiatrist to whom I went for the next two years to get myself straight. And that was that was the prevailing thought at the time, that, oh, it that was. this could be fixed. Yes, that it could be fixed. Well, the psychiatrist to whom I went said that there was evidence to believe that you could change if you wanted strongly enough to do it. And there was a 50-50 chance that you could become straight. And implicit in that is, if you don't change, it's your fault because you don't want it enough. Well, of course. There, there you go. Exactly right. And so I uh, desperately wanted to change. I went for two years, and I met a uh, beautiful young woman during the latter part of my therapy and fell in love. There's no question that I fell in love and believed I was cured. I wanted desperately to be cured and believed I was. So anyway, I married. The marriage lasted for seven years. I have two wonderful sons, and I raised the sons myself from the time the youngest was three. Ron Schmidt is the author of Once Removed. It is now out in paperback and available. You can find it on Amazon and on the independent book sites as well. And we're talking about his own life in the context of what we see today in bullying of anti-gay harassments in the schools, because as you'll be hearing from Ron over the course of this hour, this is not only a personal journey for him, it's his journey as a teacher and moving through the school system and ultimately helping to organize and educate other teachers around these same issues. So you have a seven-year marriage, you end up with two sons, and somehow you came to a place where you were no longer going to deny who you were. Was there a turning point that was a sharp mark in the sand, or was this a gradual realization that you had to do what you had to do? Um, it was a, it was a gradual realization. The reality is that basically my gay needs had begun to reassert themselves in the latter stages of the marriage, and uh, I never acted on them during my marriage. I I will say, and I make that clear in the book also. But the fact is that after the divorce, well, through this period of time, I was beginning to drink more and more and more. And I'm a, I'm a teacher. I taught all through these years. I have 33 years in the classroom and uh, 24 years of drinking. And I uh, got by by drinking, and I say got by. It became more and more difficult to get by. What happened eventually was that I decided, you know, I was going to be determined to live long enough to see my youngest son through school. And uh, then I expected that I would just drink myself to death. Both sons would be out of school then and so forth. God, what and an it, awful decision. I mean, just to think that you had on some level a consciousness of that decision. Yes. Well, I mean, it was, it was a very clear consciousness. It was at that point, basically, that I allowed myself finally to begin to access gay venues. And much is said to deride the gay baths, the bathhouses. And I am here to tell you that the bathhouse saved my life. We, that is where we're going to pick this up in just a moment. You are listening to In Deep with Angie Clare and my guest, Ron Schmidt. We're pleased to be coming to you through Washington, D.C. from Berkeley, California. And we'll be here with you every week at this time. Take a little break here, and then we'll pick up our conversation with Ron Schmidt. I'm Angie Cuero. This is In Deep. We are rebroadcasting an interview recorded in January of this year on the topic of gay bullying in schools. We have resources on our website for teachers, students, and parents on the topic, indeepradio.com. We're on Facebook, too, In Deep with Angie Cuero. Back to the interview. Welcome back to In Deep with me, Angie Cuero. Our show is known only to our closest friends as AC Does DC. If you're just tuning in, this is the first hour of our new two-hour show. And in a sense, the two topics are linked today because this hour, we are learning from a gay teacher and activist what it takes to support, encourage, and empower, word is overused, but it's important, empower LGBT students and fellow teachers. Coming up in our next hour, we'll focus on the people who froth at the mouth when they hear about this kind of hour, 
You know the creationists, um, <clears throat> pardon me, you know how the supporters of intelligent design were very, very smart about packing school boards and spinning the media to get equal time in the classroom. All right, here's a hint. They say equal time for creationism as though science is a democratic process overseen by the FCC. And on top of that, some in the media picked up on that phrase and used it as though it were accurate. Well, the same clever strategy is now forcing pure science aside in the classroom again. This time, that segment of the population is griping that equal time needs to be given over to the folks who insist there's no such thing as global warming, and even if there were, we humans have nothing to do with it. Right. So we will talk to Reverend Barry Lynn. He's the head of Americans United for the Separation of Church and State. He's going to give us a glimpse of their playbook because he knows it by heart. And we're going to meet, too, a pro-science group that is taking on the job of monitoring the classrooms. They are working to make sure that straightforward teaching of real science does not fall victim to the spinmeisters. So that's coming up in the next hour of In Deep, so stick around for that. Right now, we'll get back to my conversation with the author of Once Removed, a story of love, loss, and a cause championed. Ron Schmidt is the co-founder of his local branch of Bangle. That's the Bay Area Network of Gay and Lesbian Educators. We're hearing about his own personal progression to an out and open life and how he's helped other teachers and students along the same road, even to the courtroom. And as I mentioned, we did have some audio glitches recording this chat, for which I do apologize, but I think it's worthy. I think you will enjoy it nonetheless. Ron Schmidt, you said something very provocative before the break, and you said that the gay baths saved your life. And I'm guessing that it is emblematic of how support for who and what you are, whether it's understood from the outside or not, is the nurturing of a real human being. This is where you could be you. Yes. You, the, you hit the nail right on the head with the nurturing of a human being. The bathhouse offers whatever you want, okay? But it also offers the opportunity for men to simply be tender with each other and to embrace and to realize that this is something beautiful. The bathhouse is where I met my first lover. And in the book, his name is Degnan. And Degnan is the reason I'm alive today. It was uh, it was he who talked me down from the classes of gin at my lips, literally, and uh, helped me to gain my sobriety. It was he who taught me to accept myself and to realize that I am a worthwhile person with dignity, a human being, a man, gay man with dignity. And so I, I owe him my life. We were together for 10 years. As I gained my sobriety, it became necessary for me to come out. That happened, of course, with regard to my sons, my family members. Yeah. When I, when I initially came out to my brother, he said, don't tell our mother. She couldn't, she's too old and she couldn't handle it. Um, she said, don't tell your sons. They're too young, <laughs> and um, they're dealing with their own adolescence, which was true. Um, but there's never a good time. I was going to say, that it. leaves a pretty it's, narrow window exactly. within which you can tell people. <laughs> there's never a good time. The good time is then, right then, when you realize it has to be done. I, I did come out. There, there were several years of very difficult strain, but one of the things that my oldest son said to me when we were sitting on a beach reflecting on all of these things uh, a few years ago, and I was apologizing for a lot of the things that had happened, including my drinking and how it impacted their lives, their young lives. And my oldest son said, we never doubted you loved us, Dad. And that, you know, said a huge, huge amount to me. So, in the process then of coming out, and I was teaching, and uh, I had uh, come to Morgan Hill Unified School District and uh, applied for a position there. I was on a temporary contract at that at that period of time. So that it, brings us up just about to where you know you, you you've been a teacher, you know, and and eventually you get to this position where you're provoked by this young girl's suicide. Uh, for those who missed the earlier part of our conversation, a psychiatrist comes to the school campus and gives a, a half-hearted recitation of what kind of help is available, what might have happened, and the issue of sexual identity never came up. So where we left that story was you're talking to the principal, and you're saying, 
this has got to come out. But you had not yet come out to them. Is that correct? That's correct. It was it was during this first six months that this happened, my first semester. So I went into him and I said, if, if that was supposed to be dealing with the issue, it was like putting a Band-Aid on a gaping wound. And I said, a huge percentage of kids who commit suicide are dealing with sexual identity issues, maybe gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender themselves. And I said, I know that because I am myself gay. And when I said that, his jaw dropped and there was utter silence in his office. Um, and when he was able to talk again, he said, if that were to become generally known in Morgan Hill Unified School District, it would bring down the walls of this district. And I thought to myself, God, what a lot of power. That's amazing. <laughs> was and, that, was, was there any kernel of truth in that or was that? Yes, that, there was actually. How as, does one as, man as, coming out as gay bring down a school district? Well, in the process, understand that Morgan Hill Unified is a very conservative district. It's just south of San Jose. It's a sort of bedroom community to San Jose. Very, very uh, religious, conservative community. And what year are we talking here? Um, we're talking here about 1983. Okay. Yeah. The basic thing is that uh, I, he, he forbade me to talk about gay issues in the classroom. Uh, or to mention it at all any anywhere else, he said. If if it were to be if it were to be discussed in a classroom, it would be by the health teacher, and or by the counselors. And I said, you know, the counselors push paper. That's all they do, and they're prepping kids to be ready for the uh, SATs and CAP tests and all of that sort of thing. And uh, unfortunately, they don't deal with kids' real issues. That's part of the difficulty that we have in our schools now. The obsession with test scores and not dealing with the issues that kids are actually facing. In any event, I uh, dug in and I joined both teachers' unions, explained what I was doing. I uh, did talk about these issues in the classroom. In defiance of, of what you've been told. Yes, I did talk about the issues in the classroom. And there was clear evidence that I was not going to be rehired. But as I say, I, I joined both teachers' unions, and they both supported me in what I was doing. Can I ask you to go back to that point that when you first brought this up in class, because of course we're focusing this hour on, on what teens are going through in the classroom, what do you remember about the faces of those students when you brought up these issues that nobody else had talked about? Well, you know, it was pretty much the same situation as when I first mentioned it in a faculty meeting in the district or in a district-wide meeting. When I mentioned the G&L words, the oxygen evaporated from the room, you know? Literally, it was that, it was that sharp a distinction. As time went on, I mean, there were, there were students who were clearly shocked. Some obviously somewhat pleased because there are always those students, students who like to see, oh boy, something's going to happen here. <laughs> and uh, parents were calling not only the principal, but the superintendent. And the principal had to sit through numerous parent conferences with me. But CTA, California Federation of Teachers, backed me, supported me. I met through a conference on youth, a wonderful woman named Ann Davidson from Palo Alto. She is a, a PFLAG mother, and PFLAG is parents, families, and friends of lesbians and gays. She and I were at the same conference. Her, her, One of her sons is gay, and she and I started to talk about this, and in the latter stage of that conference, we raised it as an issue for everybody else to discuss. Let me just remind people, you're listening to Ron Schmidt talking about his life as documented in the book Once Removed. These are his experiences as a teacher coming out not only as gay for himself, but for the sake of the students within his school district. And we'll talk about this as, as we continue here. Uh, so you met this wonderful woman who is going to help you with what? We decided that what was necessary was to put together a workshop that would educate faculty, superintendents, uh, counselors, uh, and hopefully the students themselves about LGBT issues, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender issues. We put together a workshop called The Invisible Minority in Our Schools, Gay, Lesbian, Bisexual, Transgender Youth. We developed this so that we would have parents, three or four parents from each school district in which we were presenting this, and we would have students, three or four of them, from each 
school in which we were presenting. And this was a, a very courageous thing that we were asking these kids in particular to do. Some were, were reluctant at first, but we were able to gain that kind of support from them. We went to every school district in Santa Clara County, spoke to the superintendents, assistant superintendents, and presented this need. And We had CTA and National Education Association, NEA, and they supported the issue. In fact, they had us do the workshop at the Human Rights Conference and at the Good Teaching Conference, which was a statewide kind of uh, venue. Now, now, remind me, refresh my mind here, what is your status now as a teacher while you're openly doing these workshops? Well, this came out, of course, the Morgan Hill Times and the Gilroy Dispatch covered this, and the San Jose Mercury News covered this also. We went to the uh, superintendent and to the school board in Morgan Hill Unified to present the need for this kind of workshop to happen in Morgan Hill Unified. And it was extremely controversial. The first effort at doing this brought 400 people out to the board meeting. There were so many people who were avidly speaking against this happening, bringing up all the worst stereotypes about gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender people. It it ran almost to midnight, and the superintendent asked me, would you wait until next time to make your presentation because we're so out of time? And so I agreed. We had as many people the next time as well. But I did make my presentation. The news channels were there, the TV channels, the newspapers, all of that sort of thing. There was a young man walking outside with a sign uh, saying, kill the faggots, and uh, the police took the sign away from him at least. And uh, there was so much concern for my own safety at the end of this that they walked me out to my car. It was a very, very scary kind of event, but it, it, it had to be done. It had to be done. It, it, it's wrenching to think that that so many kids are hurting in our schools. One of my students, a ninth grade stu- student, um, during this period of time, uh, when I challenged a faggot slur in the classroom and, and stopped the discussion that we were about, I said, when I heard this, I said, let's talk. And so we did, and I went on about the need for everybody to be able to be accepted and to be respected for who he or she is and to not be subjected to any kind of slurs. And uh, I had a note in my teacher's mailbox at the end of the lunch period that day from a, a young woman, ninth grade student, who said, Mr. Schmidt, I want to tell you how thankful I am that you said what you did in class today. I've had kids say things like this uh, around me, and it really is hurtful. And so I said, you know, you're always welcome to come and talk if you want to. It was actually a couple of years later that she had moved on to the high school, and I got a phone call from a young woman. My name was on a hotline list for for Bangle, the Bay Area Network of Gay and Lesbian Educators, and it was through that that I was helping to generate this workshop, The Invisible Minority in Our Schools. And anyway, I got the phone call from a young woman who said uh, she didn't know who I was, only that my name was on this list or my number was on the list. And, and she said, I go to a very, very conservative school, and uh, it's really hard. And I said, I understand. I teach in a very conservative school district. And so, and then we were, suddenly we were silent and we realized. And I said, Danae? And she said, Mr. Schmidt? And so we laughed. And she had called me. She said, it, things had gotten much worse there. I told her that there was a, uh, a youth group meeting. And I said, if you want me to, I will take you. I will pick you up and take you to that. I did that, and I was grading papers, waiting for her. It took a long time for her in this in this session she was in, but she came out just beaming from ear to ear, and she said, "You don't need to drive me home. I'm going to get a ride with one of one of these new friends." And so that was wonderful. 
I asked her, when we were finally able to do the workshop in Morgan Hill Unified, I asked her, would she be one of the students from the district and speak to the administrators and, and counselors there? And she agreed. And, uh, and it was a very, very powerful moment. It's detailed in the chapter in my book entitled, Where Were You? When she had her time at the microphone, she moved up close to the microphone, held it in her hands across the desk, and she told about students in a particular class where the teacher had just set aside his lesson plan and allowed students to make remarks all period long, shouting obscenities and shouting faggot and dyke and queer and things of this sort. And she said to them, she said, I was so afraid they were going to turn to me and say, you're one of them, aren't you? And she burst into tears and she sobbed, where were you? Where were you to these administrators and counselors out there? There wasn't a sound in the room except for Danae's sobbing. And I moved next to her and put my hand on her shoulder and I handed her my clean handkerchief for her to dry her tears. And uh, uh, I, I've never washed that handkerchief. I used it to take with me to every workshop I ever did afterwards to remind me of why I needed to be there. Ron Schmidt's book is Once Removed. We're going to spend another segment with him, and in that segment we're going to talk about present-day bullying in the classroom, what lessons he learned from his own experience, his years in the classroom, his years talking to both teachers, students, and in fact, we'll throw in the administration too because they're a big part of the puzzle. You're listening to In Deep. I'm Angie Coiro. Ron, as promised, I want to take some of the hard-earned lessons of your life, both personally and inside the classroom, and apply them to the terrible slew of problems we have now with bullying, with suicides. One of the great ironies last week was my hearing about a student suicide with someone who actually had taken part in the It Gets Better video campaign. And it was a very stark reminder that even when people are offered support on some level and partake of it as best they can, it's not always enough. And every person who can contribute to the support of these students counts a little bit more. So let me ask you first, you were not out as a teenager in high school. No, was not bu- at all. Was bullying part of your experience? Sure, there were. Not me personally, but you would hear, you know, I went to Bellarmine. It was an all-male campus, still is, uh, Bellarmine College Preparatory Jesuit. And uh and so there were those kinds of uh, slurs that would, would go on periodically. Much more recently, they, there was serious concerns on the campus at Bellarmine, and I tried to offer our help with the workshop and was told by the then president of Bellarmine, no, we're going to handle this ourselves. And I said, but he said, now, Ron, we're going to handle this ourselves. He said, don't make me angry. I said, don't make you angry. The church has made me angry all my life. <laughs> and uh, anyway, he would not do it. I, I actually was able to get in to do the workshop through a principal whom I had known for years. And uh, he had been a little kid when I was working for his father during the years that I was going to Santa Clara. And he had become the principal there. And he knew me and he allowed me to come in and do the workshop. But the, the the problem is that too many times, in particular in very, very religiously based homes, kids are afraid to talk about these issues, afraid to come out. And, you know, one of my favorite quotes, and it's in my book, is from Robert Frost. And he said, home is the place where when you have to go there, they have to take you in. Something you somehow haven't to deserve. And it's just, it's it's such a powerful quote, but I have listened to parents who were conservative, deeply religious conservatives, who said, my son, I would rather have him be dead than 
uh, and then gay. And he, he, my son would have to leave my house. That's the attitude that is there. I mean, none of the none of the Christian love one another as you would have them love you. And, you know, there's a danger in our living in this what we consider liberal bastion. I'm broadcasting right now from Berkeley, and you know our show is our show and our company are San Francisco based. It's it's hard to keep in mind that this is still a reality for students that they have a message coming from home that they will internalize. You're better dead than gay. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. But the 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 boy you're talking about who committed suicide after participating in the It Gets Better campaign, Jamie Rotemeyer, very, very tragic situation. Um, and I, I saw that video of him that he made of himself, and it's almost impossible to conceive that he would have been so down after that, but it happened. It happened. There's Tyler Clementi, the 20-year-old college student who was filmed by his roommate secretly uh, as he was having sex with his boyfriend and threw himself off a bridge. Seth Walsh, a 13-year-old who uh, shot himself to death. These are horrendous kinds of things for people to have to face. And you you had just said that Children are afraid to talk about these things. So let's put those two thoughts together. When you know that kids are afraid to talk about this, and yet you know they are at risk, what is a teacher capable of doing, and what is the best way they can do it? Coming out, for one thing. Teachers teachers who are gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender need to come out and need to make it known. The reality is that, that the young woman I talked about, Danae, who said, where were you, to to the administrators in my district. We thought we had made huge progress then. We thought we had made huge progress. But two years later, a young woman from Morgan Hill Unified, Alana Flores, called me and said, I was told I should contact you. She said she and five other students had been mercilessly harassed for their perceived or real sexual identity at Live Oak High School during their whole four years there. And I met with her. I was stunned because, as I say, I thought we had made such progress. And she told me that when she went to to the assistant principal in tears, saying that she had been harassed for being a dyke or a lesbian, the assistant principal said to her, Well, are you? Are you gay? Why are you so upset? Why are you crying? And she didn't get it at all. And she had been at the workshop. So this is unbelievable. And I said to Alana, Alana, if you're still experiencing these kinds of problems, then the only thing the district will listen to is a lawsuit. And if you want me to, I will take you to an attorney and to the ACLU. And she said, absolutely. And I had no qualms about it. I I took her. Uh, through a friend, Ann Rosenzweig, who was very supportive attorney living in Morgan Hill. She suggested a, an attorney who would be best for this, Ann Brick at the ACLU. We took Alana along with a young boy, the only boy who was in this group of six kids who had been harassed, and uh, we filed the lawsuit. The reality is that the district dragged its feet for six years. They claimed that they didn't know the harassment was taking place. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals finally offered the decision that the lawsuit could proceed, that if the district didn't know, they should have known because there was ample evidence. At that point, Morgan Hill Unified settled for $1.1 million. Now, Angie one would think that that would say something to other school districts. Money at least talks, you, if exactly, not morals. Exactly. You'd think that they would say, we'd better shape it up here. But as you see, I mean, we've just been talking about Tyler Clementi, about Jamie Rodemeyer, Seth Walsh, and the young man from uh, Sacramento, Jeffrey. And it continues. And we have to have people... One of the, the CTA officials who was very, very instrumental in helping me keep my job as an out gay teacher said to me that 
when he went into his own school district and started to talk, he's straight, he's a straight teacher, but when he went in and started to talk about what was happening in these, in these workshops, he said there were three teachers in his, on his faculty he knew were gay and they absolutely were stony silent. They would not say anything. They were terrified of getting involved in the subject. We, you know, teachers have to come out. I was the only teacher in Morgan Hill Unified in my 15 years there who was openly gay. Were there others who were gay? Of course. Um, what kind of conversations did you have with them? Um, very uh, secretive. So uh, they they would, you know, talk to me in uh, my own classroom with the door closed sort of thing, and they weren't about to be able to get involved in this kind of thing. You know, they, they felt there was a need for it and so forth, but it wasn't something that they could they could take on. Which brings do. us back to your point. The first thing a teacher can do to help a student is to come out. Yes, yeah. When Gavin Newsom authorized gay marriages to take place illegally, as it turned out, that first February, six, seven years ago now, um, I volunteered for seven different days at the city hall where the marriages were taking place. And I was bringing couples from the clerk's office with their marriage licenses to the rotunda for their ceremonies. And there, the, the, the hall was lined with throngs of people who were there excited about this. And one young woman came up to me and said to me, you were my teacher in ninth grade. And you were Sorry, she said, you were such an inspiration to me. And uh, I said, oh, my God. And uh, I, I, uh, I said, you know, I can see a similarity with someone I know, but you're going to have to remind me of her name. It had been a long time, and she told me her name. And I said, oh, God, of course. I, of course I remember. I even remember where you sat in class. And she just, she just beamed. You know, the, the, the sad irony is... That story to me is very beautiful. And you know that there is a contingent of people who vote as often as you and I do yeah. that would say, you recruited that girl. You made it okay for her to be something as well. <laughs> <laughs> you I, must still I hear that. I made it okay for her to be who she is. That's the thing. That's, that's, you, you said it exactly. I made it okay for her to be who she is. You know, she knew that she was different and she realized what her difference was and she thought that gay and lesbian, bisexual, transgendered people were all these people who were off in the margins of society. She said, there you were teaching, doing what other other teachers were doing and so forth, living a normal kind of life. And uh, so it was huge for me. Our time is almost up. Tell me what your involvement is with teachers and in the classroom these days? Well, um, I've, I've written this book. I'm trying to... Uh, there's a lot of pain in the book. There's a lot of uh, heartache in the book. But there's also a lot of joy. Um, I've had some individuals say it's a hard read. It's difficult to get through. But uh, at the same time, they find it really, really valuable, I'm pleased to say. So that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to reach more people through once removed through my memoir and uh, trying to encourage them to also come out to be who they are. It uh, you know, has been a long, long journey, and, uh, and it isn't over yet. So, Well, I guarantee you there's at least one person of school age who's been twiddling around the dial. Well, see how old I am. I said twiddling around the dial. No one does that anymore, but who has heard this conversation? And you have undoubtedly helped yet another person. So I thank you so much for giving me your time and your story. Thank you, Angie. It's a pleasure to be here. So that was our rebroadcast of our January discussion about the same issue that unfortunately faces us today. As I referenced in the beginning of the show, there's been yet another gay teenage suicide, a 14-year-old in Iowa who, according to his mom, was essentially bullied to the point where he couldn't stand it anymore. We do have one small advantage these days, and that is the issue and topic of bullying has very much come to the forefront for schools, for parents, for administrators, for teachers, and we've learned a lot. 
We've learned a lot. So there's a chance for us to pass some of this information on to you about what teachers and parents can do, what the limitations are of what teachers and parents can do. Some of these resources are already listed on our website at indeepradio.com. And one of those links will take you to glsen.org. That is the Gay Lesbian and Straight Education Network. And joining us to give us some more advice from there is Sean Gaylord, who is Director of Public Policy at the GLSEN. Sean, thank you for cutting into your, your day for us. Sure. Thanks for having me. Well, I, I do want to emphasize for our audience that you in no way are representative of this particular case in Iowa, but some of the questions that it brought up for me, the early reports are that the school actually tried to do some intervention that we've we've already heard is a good idea. They tried to talk to the students in assemblies about what bullying is, why it's bad, why one shouldn't do it. Apparently, the teachers in the hallway, you know, heard and intercepted some of the badgering and, and, and brought a stop to it. What else can a school, first of all, let's talk about what else a school can do, what sort of outreach they can do, what sort of communicating with the kids can they do? Sure. I mean, I would say at, at the outset, it is true that there are schools that do everything the right way and, and these tragedies still occur. And then there are schools that, that don't have any interventions in place, but LGBT students uh, do very well. So there's always uh, the facts on the ground will really make a difference in terms of what the outcomes are in any particular situation. But I do think there are several things that schools typically can do to make a safe environment for LGBT students. GLSEN has documented for over 10 years the experiences of LGBT students. Every two years, we publish our National School Climate Survey, which documents what life is like for LGBT students around the country. And we have found repeatedly some of the same items come up uh, as items that schools safer for LGBT young people. So, for example, having the presence of supportive school staff, we know that that makes a difference in the experiences of LGBT youth. Mm -hmm. We know that the presence of a GSA also has, a Gay Straight Alliance that is, also has that effect. We know that inclusive curricula, so that that includes mention of LGBT issues, um, also has a positive effect. And what we focus on here in Washington, D.C. is the comprehensive policies, comprehensive anti-bullying policies that explicitly name sexual orientation and gender identity. Those are four items that we see regularly linked to a more positive school environment. You know, one of the real touchstones of our generation is is an emphasis on freedom of speech. And part, you know, part, some of this comes, and we've discussed this on our show before, about the really extreme polarization in our society. And regardless of the quality or quantity of one's opinions, you know, whether it be Rush Limbaugh calling someone a slut or just someone expressing their opinion on the Internet, there's a, a strong emphasis of, I have the right and privilege to say what I want. So when you're talking about getting people in school to consider carefully what it is they're about to say to someone that might be harmful, how do you address concerns that you're interfering with their free speech? Yeah, I think that's always a very tricky issue. But the fact is that students in schools, while they do still have First Amendment rights, they are schools are able to curtail those rights in order that the school run efficiently and that the school is not being disrupted. So schools do have an ability to put in place regulations around what students can and cannot say to each other. Students have the right to their opinions if they don't, uh, if they don't personally support LGBT equality, but nobody has a right to harass other students. And I think that's where um, the, the laws that, that we work on and, and other groups work on are designed to address issues of harassment and address issues where bullying is so bad that an education that a student has a hard time even achieving an education. Sean, I really appreciate the work you do, and I appreciate you taking a little time to talk to us today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sean Gaylord is with us, and he is the director of public policy for a website that you'll find linked to our own. It's the Gay, Lesbian, and Straight Education Network. Listen at glsen.org. 
In our next hour, we continue with our rebroadcast of our original show from January 2012. Our topic in the coming hour is the undermining of the teaching of real science in schools and how we can fight back. Stick around for that. I'm Angie Cuero. This is Indy. Oh, well, the man who stole the future has an oil drum for a heart and a strange preoccupation with other people's private parts. They want us to do what they say, but I'd rather live my own damn way. We'll take our culture back someday. Thanks for tuning in this week to In Deep with Angie Coiro, a production of Talkback Studios. You can get more information about us at indeepradio.com. And while you're there, you can become a member and support our work. There's a link there to contact us, too, with any questions or feedback. We're developing a series on mental health issues in our country, especially in this economy, and we'd love to have you be part of that. Please send us your topic suggestions, your stories, and your questions through our website. Click the Contact button at InDeepRadio.com. Join us again this time next week for two more hours of in-depth conversation. I'm Angie Carr. We'll see you then. You are listening to WPWC, 1480 AM, Dumfries, Virginia. We Act Radio, home of Washington's progressive working community.